Welcome everyone. My name is Denton Gentry, and we're here today to talk about climate solution models, Microsoft Excel, Python, and Jupyter. Project Drawdown was founded in 2014 to create a comprehensive plan to reverse global warming. That took the form of creating models for proven techniques and solutions to both reduce new emissions and sequester prior emissions of greenhouse gases and to model the potential of those solutions toward reaching the point of drawdown. At the start of the project, the tool chosen to create the climate solution models was Microsoft Excel, as one does. This was a reasonable choice at the time. Excel is very flexible. It would be able to support the needs of the project no matter how the model development progressed. The solution models are all fairly similar and mostly in two clusters of solutions. Reduction and replacement solutions are where one technology or practice is phased out in favor of a cleaner alternative. And land solutions, which deal with agricultural production and land stewardship, and can actually pull previous emissions back out of the atmosphere. There are also a few more unique outliers, mostly dealing with food production at scale, which is a major factor in climate change. Excel really has worked well and is still used by the project today, so why change? Well, with the number of solutions now modeled by the project, there are about a hundred Excel files being actively maintained. Most of these files contain copies of the underlying model to the point that the people working on the models actively avoid doing anything that would require them to go open the other 99 files. That's a problem. You want to allow the system to evolve and not discourage people from doing so. Also, though the initial goal of the project was publication of a book, the effort going forward is primarily online, and Excel is not your friend when it comes to distributing information online. The process is to copy the numbers out of Excel and into something else to publish online. This drove an effort to develop a new implementation of the model, one where there wouldn't be so many copies to maintain, and one where online support would not be an afterthought. Now, the Excel implementation of the model is well-structured. There are tabs in the spreadsheet to encapsulate the different modules of the overall model. Operating cost is a tab in the spreadsheet. The estimate of adoption over time is a tab, and so on. The Python implementation follows this same structure. Each module, defined as a tab in the spreadsheet, has been implemented as a Python class, and data flows through the Python implementation in the same way that it flows through the spreadsheet. A few of the Python technologies used in this project include, one, pandas. And the single most impactful thing about pandas is that the indexes are meaningful. They don't always start at zero. We have data from all over. Uh, it's typically indexed by year, and though we make an effort to normalize these, we still have some sources that start in 2014, and some that start in 2015, and some that start in 2018, and so on. And it's really easy to accidentally multiply the wrong years together. Pandas eliminated that entire class of bugs because the indexes are meaningful. We use Python data classes that were added in Python 3.7. We have classes where the fields have metadata, like what cells in the Excel spreadsheet do they correspond to, or a description that can be used as a tooltip in the UI. We also use Voila and JupyterHub, which will be the topic for the rest of this talk. Most of the effort to this point has gone into the backend models. Numbers go in, numbers come out, the user interface we're looking at here is intended for researchers looking to work with just one solution at a time, perhaps add data and see the impact on the result. It's a Jupyter notebook, preferentially running in Voila, and it runs online in a Jupyter Hub instance. Now, this is not the interface that we would use to reach a broad audience interested in learning about climate change solutions, uh, or to reach specialized audiences like policymakers or investors. Uh, this is intended for researchers working on the models. As each JupyterHub user gets a home directory and their own copy of the repository, it, it is fairly heavy to run. The advantage comes in terms of the workflow that this will enable. The workflow in working with the Excel version of the model is really that one researcher can work on a given file at a time. If multiple people each make modifications in a local version, like adding data sources, there's no good way to merge their work. Uh, one of them will end up asking the other 
earnestly and with great conviction exactly which cells of the spreadsheet they changed. Now, the ramifications of this bubble all the way up to overall management of the project, the optimal level of staffing, depends at least in part on the ability to avoid stepping on each other in files. It limits how quickly the solution model can be developed by limiting the size of the team who can work on it at a time. The workflow with Jupyter leverages a distributed version control system. We're using Git. The cohorts of researchers working on these models over the years has mostly been grad students and postdocs. And nowadays, regardless of the field, a reasonable percentage of these cohorts have a pretty good understanding of at least one programming language and will often have heard of Git, if not be really familiar with it. In this workflow, multiple people can be making modifications to the same files, and we handle it by resolving merge conflicts that result. The new implementation has been constructed using text-based file formats, which merge relatively well in cases of conflict. The most common merge conflict is two different people, each adding a new row at the bottom of a data table. And the most common resolution is basically always add both. They were both doing something to the model. You do have to plan for this. For example, use of zero-based indexes is not a good idea even reading from files. We can't reliably reference entry number 11 in the table because a merge resolution may move it, which would leave the code still working but referencing a different row than what the researcher thinks it's referencing. In the merge conflict shown here, this is a CSV file, and in code we reference these data elements by the long string name in their first column, not by the index number in the array. Avoiding use of zero-based indexes in files is related to the earlier point about pandas. Meaningful indexes and content-addressable data are helpful in avoiding a whole class of bugs. So, back to version control. Using a Git workflow also helps achieve another goal of the project, of allowing finer granularity models of solutions using data specific to a region and driven by teams of researchers in that region, allowing them to operate mostly autonomously. Distributed version control can allow review and vetting to occur at multiple steps along the way for a change to make its way into the canonical model. Now let's talk about visualization. Uh, data relating to climate change can be challenging to visualize because there's always uncertainty. We're visualizing very large systems with a great deal of inertia. Jupiter made the job of data visualization easier in that all of the computation in the model is handled using pandas data frames, and the visualizations are packages which take data frames as their inputs. We haven't had to figure out how to serialize the data frame to JSON and send it over to a JavaScript front end. Uh, to the extent that that kind of serialization happens, it's been within the packages that we are using. This example is a 3D line chart. It's trying to show results both at the level of the entire world, as well as at the level of major regions, and individual countries which are especially large emitters. We call it a frizzle chart, and it was constructed using IPy volume. Putting nine lines on a 2D graph didn't work very well. There was too much data squeezed into too small of a space. Allowing the data to stretch out over a third dimension is an attempt to make it more meaningful. The model produces results at the level of major regions like Latin America or the OECD 90 countries and breaks out the US, the EU, China, and India separately. We use Altair Choropleth maps to visualize these results. Because the model produces a result for each year, in the 2D map, we choose 2050 as the year. Uh, in climate work, 2050 is the year where we absolutely, positively must have ceased emissions and reached net zero if we want to have a livable planet. We've experimented with alternate presentations of this data which animate. Uh, in a 2D presentation, we could only vary the colors, which didn't honestly work very well. Uh, we've instead experimented with IPy volume to animate, uh, which has potential. This particular globe needs some more work. We use Altair and IPy volume for most visualization. The Vega support in Jupyter Lab and the plugin to use for Notebook and Voila has also been quite useful. Uh, we have Python code to emit Vega describing a tree map and nested donut chart, 
uh, giving an overview of the different climate solutions that have been modeled. We're currently running this system using the littlest Jupyter Hub on a single virtual machine running in a data center. And so far, that's been sufficient. The pool of researchers working on the model is a few dozen people, and only a few of them tend to be active at any given time. If we find ourselves scaling up by taking contributions beyond the internal cohort of researchers to the point that a single VM isn't enough, we expect to be able to build a new Jupyter Hub instance, which shards the individual sections across Kubernetes nodes. The service runs in a data center, and we've set up some basic monitoring of a prober and stack driver within the VM. The prober just checks the login page because you can do that without authentication. Uh, I'd love to take the time to save some credentials and let the prober check that an actual Jupyter server can run, but haven't done so yet. Incident response is mostly the universal first troubleshooting step of turning it off and back on. Uh, in my day job, we are somewhat more sophisticated than that, so we can see that kind of response from here, but haven't gotten there yet. Stack driver monitors disk space, CPU utilization, memory occupancy, and other VM statistics. We're trying to get Prometheus stats collection from JupyterHub set up now. It would be really nice to have the monitoring store some time series data about JupyterHub for capacity planning, like how many servers were running simultaneously, uh, how many accounts currently exist. Right now, uh, capacity planning is to SSH to the server and count home directories and running processes, and that's suboptimal. Now, let's talk about testing. One key point about this project is that it's tasked to faithfully reproduce an existing model methodology, one which has already published results on a number of occasions and which has undergone significant peer review. It isn't a blank sheet of paper. One area that this project is not required to faithfully reproduce is in testing, because for the Excel models, there are no tests. Because of course there are no tests. The Python implementation has unit tests, of course, and currently achieves 94% test coverage. Many of the unit tests were constructed by taking both the input data and the expected result from the Excel file. Corner cases discovered at the larger levels of testing have similarly been turned into unit tests from the Excel files. Within the model, the most basic modules are the collections of results for a particular purpose, like operating costs or emissions reduction, and these have unit tests of the individual functions. Integration tests cover larger assemblies of code, where those various modules have been strung together, outputs to inputs, to comprise the full model. These tests are done at the level of individual solutions, uh, like utility-scale solar farms. The test verifies that the solution produces reasonable outputs. There are also tests of the full system in two ways. First, we wrote an automated test which runs the Excel version of the module and the Python and compares that the results at each step of the calculation are within a floating point margin for error. The test can show that the new implementation gets the same results for the same reasons as the original. This is the primary way to show that the new implementation is a faithful reproduction of the original. The second system test is done from the Jupyter level using Selenium to test outputs. That first system test is constructed as a largish collection of tuples of Excel cell ranges and the Python method which corresponds to them. It compares that they match with some additional complexities to handle cases where certain results are not used by certain solutions. This system test is one of the crucial bits of infrastructure. It's been rewritten several times, and the reason behind each version may be informative. The Excel version of the model contains various bits of Visual Basic code, especially in choosing a set of input assumptions called a scenario. We can't just open the spreadsheet with a file reader. None of them run Visual Basic code. We have to remotely control Excel to do that. Excel Wings is an open source Python package which uses native OS facilities like uh, Apple events on macOS to control Microsoft Excel. Version 1 of the integration test would start Excel, access the different sheets, read values, all by asking Excel to perform the operation and send back the result. 
this worked, but the test would sometimes just hang, like an event got lost, causing the test to time out and fail. The more Excel files we added, the less likely it would make it through without hanging. We got to about 10 Excel files for 10 solutions before it, it just became unworkable. It would hang almost every run. Version 2 of the system test used Excel Wings to run the Visual Basic code to select inputs, but then would save the resulting file to a temporary directory. We would then read the values directly from the file, not asking Excel to do it. Hanging Excel was really no longer a problem at that point. It basically never happened because of the small number of calls that were left. This got us to about 50 Excel files before we really hit the next problem. It was pretty slow. It got to the point of not being able to complete all of the tests in an overnight run. Reading the Excel file was quick, but remotely operating Excel took a long time. This led to the development of the third version. Decouple the initial step altogether. We run Excel Wings offline, and we save the resulting values to a zip file. The zip file is checked into the source repository. This version of the integration test itself does not use Excel Wings at all. It opens the zip file to get the data for the test case. It's able to run all 70 of the current solution models in less than an hour. Uh, reading the zip files is way faster even than reading the saved Excel files used to be. At this point, I expect this version of the integration test to be the final one. I expect us to get to the point where we discontinue Excel altogether before needing to revisit this test. We also test the full system from Jupyter using Selenium. The test starts a browser with no display and waits for the overview page to render. That has a column of the available solutions with checkboxes to activate them. We added IDs to the checkboxes with a set pattern to make it easy for the Selenium test to find them and to activate one of them. It waits for the model to run and to render the result, and then it checks for the various outputs. Again, we added IDs and class names to make it the test not be fragile for tweaks as the layout of the UI changes. Selenium now runs as part of the continuous integration test to make sure that we don't break the UI accidentally. This whole Selenium test was an open source contribution. It's linked here. This talk focused on use of Jupyter. Uh, there are other talks posted online about this project, uh, one about testing specifically, several about the overall effort. They're linked from the slides. While I implemented quite a bit of what has been discussed in this presentation, this is an open source project which has had a number of contributions over the two or so years we've been working on it. A list of people who have contributed to the software at this point in time is shown here. We also maintain a Zenodo JSON file of contributors to be able to add titles or an academic institutional affiliation for use in generating an acknowledgement in papers published which use the results from this system. I really recommend that projects which might be used in publication do something like this. It's, it's a good thing to do. And if you'd like to get in touch, here are some contact channels. Thank you.